Uh, all right. Well, hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our Canadian Blockchain Consortium for our next webinar. This one's hosted by our incredible FinTech committee, led by um, the amazing Emma Todd, who's going to be our moderator for today. And the panel is called Defending Against Emerging Crypto Threats. So uh, with rapidly growing US $1.75 trillion in cryptocurrency industry has become a prime target for cyber criminals with an average of more than 2.5 million US in digital value stolen from exchanges each day. As the price of Bitcoin, Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies has skyrocketed, the sophistication of criminal attacks has likewise increased with large operations that typically target banks shifting to digital finance, including exchanges, ICOs, and mining pools. So we're going to discuss today how can investors and exchanges defend against the growing risk of threats like ransomware and phishing. So it's going to be such an incredible panel today. And before we start off, I just want to explain a little bit about CBC, who we are and what we do. So we were founded back in 2017. Um, we emerged from uh, Alberta. We were originally called the Alberta Blockchain Consortium. And we were really focusing on being that driving force for education, advocacy, and events, mainly because there's so much information out there. A lot of people are curious where to go to get accurate, real-time, relevant information. And we want to be that place where you knew what you, when you were coming to get that information, it was definitely accurate. We get involved in a lot of education. So we teach free classes every single month. We get involved in research projects. And of course, we're always advocating for all the incredible companies in the space that are doing amazing things to propel blockchain technology uh, adoption across the country. Of course, as a not-for-profit, we couldn't do what we do without our absolutely amazing um, members. And a lot of these members have been with us since day one. So a big shout out and thank you to everybody that you're seeing on the screen right now. One of the other things that we really love to do is we want you to engage with us. So, you know, please ask questions. Our panel is here to answer any questions that are relevant, particularly to this topic. Um, we'd love you to follow us. If there's anything that you uh, like that our panel has said today, please engage us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, use the hashtag Canada Blockchain. We'll be sure to like it and read it right there. Uh, we also have started a magazine, so it's free content we share every single month. It's about an hour long read. We do a lot of research in the, in the space every single month and put it down into a um, really comprehensive guide through this. It'll keep you up to date on all of our events, amazing companies, uh, some really good articles and stuff for you to read. So if you just go to candablockchain.ca, you'll see it directly on our website. And last but not least, to introduce uh, this incredible panel, so I'm going to introduce um, our amazing moderator, Emma Todd, and she's going to introduce the rest of our amazing speakers for today. So Emma is the CEO of MMH Blockchain Group, as well as the chair of our incredible FinTech committee. And uh, she's a board member for the Canadian Blockchain Consortium, which is our group. She's an advisory council member for Girls in Tech. And she's also a chairwoman and executive board member for the Blockchain for Impact, which works alongside the United Nations. So we're really, really excited, Emma. Thank you so much for being our moderator here today. I'm going to hand this incredible panel over to you to kick it off. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire, for suggesting this. And I'm so glad that we could do this today. I am excited. Um, so I was going to dive right in and, and totally introduce our amazing panel. And then we're going to start hitting them with some hard hitting questions. So we're going to start with you, Ricardo. So everybody, I want to introduce you to Ricardo Diaz. He is a cybersecurity decentralized ledger technology professional and technology consultant with over 20 years experience. You previous, he previously worked for Oracle for 13 years, designing and selling enterprise software solutions. And he has customers all around the world and that they include large multi multinational enterprise businesses. And he is a human rights advocate. Ricardo, I'm so happy to have you here. He actually has a very large bio, but I kind of condensed it down because you've achieved some pretty impressive things. So we're happy to have you here. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Excellent. And we have Dave. Dave is the founder and CEO of Cypher Trace. Um, and he is a serial entrepreneur in crypto and security and fintech. And I'm not going to get into too many details, but Dave holds 24 US patents. Dave, we got to talk about that later on. That's pretty impressive. And uh, previously worked or founded some very impressive companies, including Iron Key, and uh, he's definitely an industry expert on blockchain security, internet fraud, and cybersecurity, so we're happy to have him here. 
And he is also the founder and chairman of APWG, a security nonprofit with over 1,500 corporate and government members. So thank you so much, Dave, for joining us. We're very happy to have you here. And then we have Alex. We have Alex from, uh, he is a CEO and co-founder of Max. And uh, he's having a very good day today. I'll let you expand on that a little, little bit later, Alex. And uh, Knox provides a Bitcoin custody service where customer funds are insured up to their full value. And that's the first in the industry. Alex has spent the past several years diving into risk transfer as it applies to software in order to develop novel ways to ensure that, to ensure modern software systems. So, you know, guys, um, Alex is doing really great things. I'll let you guys um, ask me about that later. Feel free to dive, dive into the chat. And uh, we'll, we'll get this started. Does anyone have anything else that they want to add that I didn't, I didn't talk about? No, okay, excellent. Well, well I do, Emma. So okay, you missed one important it. thing out of my bio, which is I have a master's degree uh, in computer science from the University of Calgary. So I spent... Uh, a lot of time in Alberta. I got a well. I really got a master's degree in skiing, and they gave me the computer science one as an honorary degree. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. so well, I am in fact I am in that. fact Canadian as well as American, and I also have British passport as well. But I'm very proud of my Canadian oh. citizenship. Well, yeah. thank you. We are proud of that too. Thank you. you so you have three passports, is what I'm getting out of this. <laughs> yeah, but it's also been interesting to work with, you know, Canadians that have come down to California as I did 20 years ago, and I started my career in, in uh, at Apple. I met someone at a okay. ski lift um, at Sunshine Village skiing um, out of Calgary, and he offered me a job at Apple, and I was like, well, Calgary's great, but beach, Apple, I'll go there. So that's how I came down, and I've spent the last 20 years here in, in, in security and crypto. Okay, let me get this right, my friend. You met someone on the ski lift and they offered you a job at Apple? Yeah, in the, it started out at, in, the, in the research group at Apple and ended up, I ended up four years later working for the CEO at Apple. So, um, you know, yay skiing in Alberta. Yeah, cold. Let's go to Canada, let's go for Alberta. That's really impressive, I love that story. <laughs> oh, you are very interesting, my friend. You're very interesting, but we're gonna get into this. I feel like we need to have like, you know, a, a good Q&A after that, that, that needs to last a good hour, just the Q&A itself. But here's this question and it's open to anybody on, um, on the panel to answer. You know, it's been widely reported that we've had more than 300 million stolen globally and that 2020 was the worst year ever on record for attacks in digital finance companies like exchanges. And so far, does it look like this, this trend is going to go is going to grow. You think in twenty twenty one, or do you think it's going to you know go down a little bit? What are your thoughts? Um, I'll take I'll take the stab at the first one. I think it's it never changes. I, I think that um, this what we do as architects uh, and cybersecurity professionals, we're always designing you know trying to design the best uh, defense in depth uh, architectures and. Um, the hacks that we see in every day and until the right digital asset infrastructure is put in place um, with the right combination of technology and people, uh, even that it's, it's always going to uh, continue. Uh, I think as long as there's money involved, especially, <laughs> I don't see it going down. I think that the, the attacks become more intense. Uh, these exchanges are, are the biggest honeypots uh, that there are in, in the industry. And I think it's more, it really comes down to, uh, you know, having great companies like CypherTrace and, and other security uh, solutions vendors uh, um, like, like Knox and what they do to, to all these different layers that you have to add as a cybersecurity professional, it's, it's really important. So I, I definitely don't see the trend coming down. It just keeps going up and uh, which is why, you know, the regulations keep, uh, keep piling on. And we'll talk about regulations mm -hmm. a little bit with, some of the great work that uh, Dave's been doing. Now, I just a little sidebar. I've been in the industry for about five years. And I was surprised at how, in the when I first got in, how many exchanges were hacked and just never reported it. Just never reported. Said, you know, we'll find a way to put the money back. We're just going to keep it quiet. And you only find out because you know people, and you know, there's a little bit of talk, uh, and it's just really absolutely surprising. So. Um, I think obviously, you know, uh, with the regulations and things like that, people are being forced to report things and they're kind of going out about a little bit more open now. But 
this is just North America, right? You know, you have the rest of the world to contend with. Oh, I just totally threw something out there. People are like, oh, we didn't want to talk about that, but it, it does happen. <laughs> it does happen. Hey, public, so, companies, public companies and certain, uh, there's um, these certain, I forget what the, the rules are called, but there's, there's these, there are laws and legislations around disclaimer that you have to, as a public company, uh, tell the public that in the US for sure, I forget exactly what it's called, uh, the legislation, but you have to report it. But yeah, I think if you're a private company, uh, they're not going to, it's not, you're not gonna tell people that your security sucks, right? So, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. please bring us your money. Our security, we're, we're working on it. It's okay for now, it'll get better. <laughs> so, you know, my question for you guys is, what do you think are the most common types of cyber attacks on crypto exchanges that they have currently? And how much, of, how much of the success of hacking results from human caused error with phishing? Well, I'll take a first stab at it. Um, so what we've um, been working with the Cloud Security Alliance and put out a white paper that's uh, really kind of a comprehensive review of exchange security um, attacks and a threat model around it. Uh, certainly, phishing is one of the one of the bigger ones. So there's phishing of your consumers. So I take over your account, and maybe I um, I do a SIM swap if you've got a lot of money in your account, so I can take over your SMS. And then if you text me a message to log in, I can still do it. So we do see that um, being targeted, uh, but we also see targeting of internal employees at exchanges as well with phishing attacks where they're trying to take over internal accounts of the people who work at the exchanges. And then oh. that allows them access. Yeah, that allows them access to potentially steal the private keys that effectively means you're stealing everyone's money. So if you can steal the private keys of the hot wallet, that is the thing that people use to do their trading, then you're done. Um, so, mm -hmm. and, and I think that this ties into to, you know, what Alex is doing um, as far as trying to protect and segregate the majority of your funds, you know, off of the internet so that there's a really strong security mechanism. Um, and that, 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 you know, if, if you are attacked or fished, you, you, you don't lose everything. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's pretty impressive. That is absolutely, um, impressive because I didn't really realize, you know, think about them going after, um, employees and, you know, getting access to, so that's a lot of actually, you know, a thought process that goes into that and looking at who the employees are and who actually has access to what and really targeting that employee or the employees around that. So it's really best, I guess, for, um, for companies to make sure that not one employee doesn't have access to, to the entire kit and caboodle. You really parcel it out. No, but uh, I, okay. for sure. And I think that there's, I mean, the other type of exchanges that are out here that we're dealing with, uh, which are new in the crypto space, are these uh, decentralized exchanges, right? And you have um, uh, you have a lot of these decentralized uh, protocols uh, that um, have these great uh, innovations like uh, flash loans, and you know you can they provide uh, the the, the, crypt, the financial services innovation that's happened in the crypto space is phenomenal, but uh, the kind of hacks that you're seeing. Um, are really innovative and really elegant uh, that that go beyond just phishing, right? I think that you'll see some of these uh, these smart contract attacks that happen uh, to, at these at these decentralized exchanges or these DeFi protocols are uh, are pretty impressive. You know, it, it doesn't it isn't the typical hey, I'm your CEO, can you change my password? Phishing attack. These are complicated attacks that that require a little bit more intelligence than your standard script kitty. Uh, you know, attack, but um, it's impressive. Uh, but uh, but now you have typical traditional exchanges which are centralized, and now we also have to protect uh, these decentralized exchanges and and these DeFi protocols. That now we're getting demand uh, design to design digital asset infrastructure that uh, it's called the um, institutional DeFi. Right? Can you design a system, uh, a security system, a financial services system that can interact with these um, risky uh, DeFi protocols, right? The, the demand is there from the biggest investment banks in the world, um, but you have to have a really solid uh, 
uh, strategy on, and with you know, solutions like CypherTrace and put up the, the right uh, security and privacy internal controls to prevent, uh, uh, you know, some there's amazing, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's amazing for the people that lose their money, but if you look at yeah. these kind of attacks, it's pretty impressive what they, what they can do. Really? So you really do need to have a really good backend system to make sure that you're doing all you can to combat this because just a regular security protocol just isn't going to help you is what I'm getting out of this. Yeah, it works in 2016 isn't going to work right now. Yeah. I think also just yeah, speaking to what uh, David mentioned, certainly internal governance controls for these exchanges is quite critical. Um, and it's something we spent a lot of time thinking about at Knox. Um, you know, we have several layers of security, including um, caring about internal collusion on our side um, and making sure that that can be fully insurable um, has allowed us to produce a system such that we can be reasonably confident that our own agents are not capable of stealing. Um, and then kind of pairing that with some governance controls um, that are exchange members uh, participate with um, making sure that, you know, a single one of them can't unilaterally move a large sum of funds, um, the withdrawal limits are placed, um, there are a lot of things that are not available directly on the base protocol um, can actually be addressed. Okay, so guys, I apologize, I'm totally going off script because I find this so very interesting. Um, and I'm just curious, you know, just in terms of organizations that have had, you know, their employees targeted, like, um, uh, what are their security protocols like? Because they're, you know, they're working on the client, but are they are they making sure that they're okay? You know, when when their employees come and log in and things like that. So, um, are they discovering any holes in their systems that they need to fix before they kind of, you know, go out to the client? Yeah, most most companies I'm mean, have their security assurance and programs to educate employees and uh, you know regular training and and then companies like you know Galax is you know they have very strict, uh, not only the right technology architecture, but they have their own policy and controls on, on how uh, um, money is moved and any, any, any kind of vulnerability that you can think of. They, you could try your best to, to uh, prevent these things from happening, but uh, someone always gets in. And the number one hack, if you would, or threat is always an insider threat. And the insider threat, I believe, is still the top uh, threat that, that, that I've seen for the last 20 years where it's either somebody gets fished or there's some bad actor um, uh, that that's on the inside. So even having the best policies in place and, the, and uh, controls, you can still uh, lose your shirt. Yeah, this is just, you know, we, kept getting, we keep getting smarter, but the, the crooks keep getting smarter, smarter too, right? So, so here's my question for you guys. One of the biggest challenges facing visual finance is a level of sophistication of the hackers, which we just touched on. In one of the best known cases, a group called CryptoCore sold more than 200 million from various exchanges over two years. How can the industry defend against these massive organized crime networks? And if anybody wants to share on um, a little bit more about this CryptoCore hacking, that would be great. Well, I'll certainly take on the uh, the other part, if you will, on, on how okay. the industry can help to defend against it. So um, yeah. first one is education. So there are tons of exchanges. I mean, Ricardo's right about like the big exchanges understand and have been putting in place security systems. And, you know, Alex's team has been building out a lot of those systems and best practices. But there are a, 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 on, at CypherTrace, you know, we track these exchanges and other, you know, cryptocurrency and virtual asset blockchain companies, and we are tracking 50 new ones a week, and uh, between eight and 10 new crypto exchanges that have access to banking facilities to move money in and out of the system. So that's a lot. So when you start thinking about there's 5,000 virtual asset companies. There's eight or 900 at least exchanges that have access to bank account and can swap information in and out. And it growing at that rate, I mean, it's exponential growth. So a lot of those companies are really great ideas that five people in a garage with two dogs who wrote half the code basically are coming up with and launching out into the public, whether it's DeFi or a full exchange. And um, this is where the education needs to come in because these people don't have the security training to do it. The second thing I would say is that, you know, and that's where the criminals go to attack. The second thing I would say is information sharing is another important thing. So being able to not just share information about 
how best to secure your systems and what your best practices are and who are the cool vendors, but also information sharing around who got hacked and being able to publish those addresses in secure forums where we can basically say, okay, let's start freezing those funds. Let's trace those funds. Let's do blockchain analytics on those funds. Right. Now, and, and the other thing that, that that's all great information, Dave, I agree, I agree with you. I think that, you know, the biggest frustration I've had as a cybersecurity professional, um, working with startups, uh, and for example, and, and just product teams is that um, in the startup world, uh, you know, the, what is the main driver when you're raising funds, uh, unless you're a security company, you know, like Alex's or yours, it's, it's really about at the end of the day, you have your, your investors that you have to make happen. You have to, you have to drive revenue, you know, how quickly can you get to, to the black into the black and what, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it wasn't for this, this, uh, this process where most startups and most product, uh, um, development folks focus really on the functionality of their application. Um, and they'll bolt on security later, right? Because when you understand, uh, the, the cost it takes to implement uh, all the right security controls, uh, how it could slow down your application, um, how it makes security makes it more complex for your end users. There's all these negative things about adding uh, security controls to your application, your service, um, following secure coding best practices, for example. That, that's something that you know, I would say 80, 90% of every startup I meet, they don't, they don't have a, they've got great engineers, right? And they follow good software development methodology as far as how they develop code, but rare, very rare do you see uh, soft, you know, secure software development best practices around developing good code, uh, secure code. You know, having, uh, you know, the, what I see in the, in the, in the crypto space, which is, a, which is, it's a good sign is that when you look at, uh, there's a website for, um, called the DeFi score that's run by consensus that uh, helps protect um, consumers by educating them on the, the, the score of a particular DeFi protocol that they're going to invest their money into. And in that website, they, they evaluate the, um, they score, they have a, a, a criteria, but two of those top criteria are, are you auditing your, your, you know, do you have security audits regularly on at your company? And also um, what kind of bug bounty do you have from a security perspective, right? So bug bounties are just uh, having, uh, offering up $20,000 or whatever amount of money to constantly hack at our code. If you find something, please tell us and we'll pay you money. But so those kind of practices are, are very uncommon uh, in the so in the in the startup space, right? And um, and even you'll see in in large software companies. I worked at Oracle. We have they have a great CSO and Marianne Davidson, and she is is uh, I would say a majority of her job was when we would either acquire a company or when there's a new product rolling out, is she would go in with her team and do the due diligence around secure coding best practices. So, uh, you know, it's, so it's not just education of your employees, um, but it's also, um, if you're going to get into this space and crypto space where you're the biggest target in the world when it comes to dealing with some of these money, um, you should, as an investor, uh, as, a, as an executive in the company, you should follow at some point say, well, what about security and privacy? What are we doing? Not just from, you know, great solutions like CypherTrace uh, that, can, that can detect from an AML perspective whether uh, uh, a Bitcoin address comes from a terrorist or not, but, but also what have you done at the code level to protect uh, your business, right? And, uh, and yes, it may cost more money um, and it, it's an investment, but if you wait to bolt it on after or you wait until after you're hacked, then, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've been hired uh, before, I, you know, I was an independent consultant because something has already happened, right, to a customer, right? It's just more often that they'll call you after the fact. It's like, okay, you're right. <laughs> so, but um, that's, it's part of the course. For the last 20 years, I haven't, it's, at the end of the day, we're all about making money and, and, and driving uh, revenue is number one. Uh, it's hard to get best practices around, uh, you know, what are the right security technologies and software development practices that you should put in place for your company along with whatever your go-to-market strategy is, so. 
So here's my question for you guys. Um, with all the hacks that you have seen, how many of them do you think would have been preventable if they just had the right security in place versus the ones where it was something, it was a new sophisticated method that was being used and so they wouldn't have been able to avoid it? What percentage do you think? I know this coming in. I think question. it's hard to put a percentage. I mean, the, the kind of hacks that are, it all depends. Like a lot of things, hacks in the crypto space, especially, um, again, again, it comes back to just bad code, right? It's not so much a hack where somebody deliberately, um, uh, you know, attacked you with a bunch of bots and, and, and broke through some weak passwords. Uh, the, the famous DAO hack that split uh, one of the popular cryptocurrencies in two, uh, Ethereum, into Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, was a $150 million uh, fund that they had and uh, there was a smart contract, a, co a, a piece of code that controlled the funds and a hacker or really uh, just a really good programmer was able to look at the code and say, all right, well, there's a, there's a vulnerability here because I can just change the address of where the, the money is sent to and, and he or she did. And $50,000, $50 million was liquidated from that fund and then all this drama happened and uh, they had to roll back uh, the, the history of the blockchain, which is a big no-no in the crypto space. Um, and then you had two chains created. So, but that hack wasn't uh, the traditional cybersecurity hack. It was just some coder saying, oh, look, you know, the, the, somebody made it an error. There's a, a human error so common. And so if you don't have bug bounties and you're not auditing your, your, your code and you don't have a process to these kind of hacks happen all the time. So, uh, but again, it's not the, I don't think that you can't do much to prevent uh, these things from happening. You can preach about it like we do on these panels, but uh, unless uh, more education happens and more people understand what defense and depth strategies are and the kind of policies and procedures you got to put in place, um, it will continue happening, Emma. So prevention, obviously, and that's the prevention is better than the cure because yeah. you know, it costs a lot more. So many other things your parents say to you suddenly make sense in different, you know, different ways now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I am curious, you know, so hot walls that store keys in an online accessible way are definitely easier for use for purchases and trading, but they're the main target for hackers, as we know. Like, what do you believe are the best practices for wallet storage for investors? I mean, I feel like that's like a giveaway for Alex. Like, Alex, you probably have your name all over it. <laughs> yeah, personally, yeah, certainly I can start. I do strongly believe in cold storage um, for now and in the foreseeable future. Um, I do think also network connected storage um, solutions have been um, perhaps unfairly looked at as very unsafe. I do still believe it is possible to produce relatively safe network connected storage systems. And it's something that we've put into production um, in the past few months, you know, parlaying a lot of the technology that we set up um, for from the cold custody system. Um, it's something that we're gonna be actively onboarding people on. Um, but I do believe certainly to this point, exchanges and operators that are storing tens, hundreds uh, of millions, perhaps billions of dollars worth of um, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency assets should be using predominantly cold storage. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll maintain that line. Um, and certainly it is easier to ensure for a good reason. Um, and perhaps that is another point is that in our case, we're capable of providing um, for exchanges one-to-one -one insurance um, on their cold assets. Um, and it's something that would be obscene and expensive if we attempted to keep our all holdings um, on network connected systems. Yeah. Yeah, and I think from, um, there's two types of, uh, um, there's, there's self custody, someone who has their own wallet, like our, our famous uh, BRD bread wallet. You know, and then you have your um, enterprise custody or centralized custody. So where, where a company like Alex is control your keys, right? So best practices, I think that, you know, you have hot, cold uh, type of, uh, you know, hot wallet with something that you would have like an exchange. Um, but the idea is that like anything is that if you have a hot wallet, uh, you also have maybe a hardware wallet and you put some security controls in uh, like Ledger or Nano around when when somebody wants to move money outside of your your particular uh, wallet, then at least have have one layer of 
of uh, protection, you know, two-factor authentication or something that's going to protect you. Um, obviously, what Alex says is for sure, it's the safest way is to is cold storage and, and then disconnect it from the network completely, you know, air gap it. But um, I think one of the other uh, exciting technologies actually came out last year and it's something that um, uh, uh, Vitalik, uh, you know, famous Canadian uh, Buterin, talked about in a, in a post early in early January, January was um, this technology around, the question was how can we make uh, a wallets more secure and, um, and safe and, and, and improve the, the, the user experience too. Because today having to remember uh, 12 uh, words in a particular order and then writing it down on a piece of paper and, and storing it in your bank or breaking it up into multiple pieces and putting it in, in banks, um, that's, it's difficult. Someone like my father or my mother would never do that. Um, so social recovery uh, wallets and social recovery technology is something that uh, he talked about last year in early, um, uh, I think it was March, 2020, uh, the Argent wallet came out, which was a social recovery one. And what it is, is that instead of relying on um, your, you know, basically your memory and some of the risks of that is using technology to, um, to leverage, for example, I want four out of seven uh, approvals or humans to approve a particular transaction. Uh, and so if adopting social recovery technology in uh, wallets uh, is the next generation of all these different types of wallets you see out there where being able to identify seven individuals that, that don't know each other and say, I want you to be a guardian. All right, uh, and to if, if I have to recover my wallet or if there's a certain amount of money that's going to be transferred out of my wallet, um, uh, please approve for these individuals, my wife, my lawyer, um, a friend of mine, uh, but at least have that kind of control where as opposed to, okay, hey, I lost my, it happens, I lost my, my key phrase uh, and this, people have lost millions of dollars this way. But if you have a social recovery, the Loop Ring is another company that came out with their own uh, social recovery system. And, and it, again, it's, it's this type of technology. It's not just uh, a better security, uh, in my opinion, uh, a better way to manage your, your, your crypto keys, um, but also makes, uh, you know, solves one of the biggest challenges we have in security, which is it makes the user experience better, right? And so unlike the traditional model we have in, in crypto, which is, you know, trust in, Trust in math, not humans. This is why blockchain technology is great. Social recovery uh, wallets and this type of technology um, that's becoming more prevalent, it kind of flips that saying, well, still trust in math, um, but uh, when it comes to your money, you, you also have the option of maybe trusting your dad and your, your attorney and, and having them say, all right, install this wallet. Um, and when the time comes, if the worst should happen or someone's trying to move $5 million out of my wallet, uh, please, you know, that the, there are mechanisms in place that will prevent that, right? Because moving money out of a wallet is, is easy if you have access to, once you get access to it uh, and you know the, the you, you, get, you get past the security, then it's just a matter of transferring funds, right? It's pretty quick, it happens, so. Yeah, I think also speaking to that point, uh, people are often surprised to hear me say that, you know, I still believe people should maintain their own keys. Um, so Knox, for example, really exists as a custodian for those who either absolutely refuse to keep their own keys or, you know, cannot from a legal perspective. Um, but um, to Ricardo's point, we're still in the early innings, if you will, of what, um, you know, personal key management looks like. Um, and I think even, you know, someone like myself, I've been in this space for a long time. If I describe my key management, my personal key management system to somebody, it's not something that somebody um, would want to or should be expected to replicate. So I think coming up with some friendly methods by which people can self custody is going to be pretty important for the space. Um, I do believe it's important that, and I would hate to live in a world in which most Bitcoin came to actually rest in centralized custodians, um, even if it benefits my, you know, our business directly. Yeah, and I also think that the, today we have these different types of wallets, hot, cold uh, wallets, et cetera. Um, but when it comes to financial services, you know, this concept of uh, you can't get access to your funds because it's sitting in a secure uh, disconnected storage is not good for business, right? Businesses don't, and traditional finance world doesn't work that way. So the, the right um, security, again, this is what we design, uh, the kind of a solution, digital asset architectures that, that we design with CypherTrace uh, every week is that 
can you design uh, a, a system that allows you to not really care where it's hot or cold? You, you should have a good you know, hardware-based encryption and, and the different layers that you have around you know, multi-sig or multi-party compute type technology. But at the end of the day, um, when it comes to if crypto uh, wants to go mainstream and you're gonna see a lot of these institutional banks that, that are already getting into the space, um, being able to get access to your funds and be able to trade your funds uh, quickly is, is what the uh, financial services system is all about. You know, Visa processes transactions at, at uh, what, 50,000 transactions per second. Uh, when you have to think about, okay, well, the money is sitting in this wallet in cold storage, how do I deal with it? Uh, so designing security mechanisms uh, and, and making sure that you can get access to these funds. And there's a lot of really cool technology aside from just, uh, you know, aside from just security technologies, there's tokenization of these assets and, uh, and, and being able to take a, a digital asset, convert it into another uh, token and then use that token to trade with. So there's, there's all kinds of techniques to improve this challenge of, well, if, if, if the money's sitting in cold storage and I need to do a financial transaction between two banks, right? Um, how do I get to that? How quickly can I, can I settle that transaction? Right, um, and that because that's what it's, it's about is that can you in the financial services world how quickly can you settle? How can I reduce my counterparty risk and, and credit risk, um, and then we'll start doing business with you. If I if I integrate with you and you don't have an answer to that, and then we have to get around. Okay, it's going to take me you know a couple of days to get approval uh, out of my cold storage, and it, it just slows things down. And so, your innovation is going to help, and good security solutions. Uh, and automation uh, with smart contracts, for example, um, secure smart contracts are the kind of technology innovations that are going to help evolve the you know the traditional wallets that are hot and cold out there. I guess that, that's my opinion. I don't know, Dave, if you what your thoughts on kind of the evolution of uh, wallets and 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 where the where the keys sit is one thing, but I think designing the the right type of uh, not only internal controls but also that you know that prime brokerage layer, the application layer. Um, what kind of uh, controls do you see uh, that are required that can kind of take us forward into where we're at today um, and where we need to go tomorrow when it comes to these you know the investment bank giants and the PayPal's of the world. Well, I, I agree with you, definitely, Ricardo. But I also agree with Alex quite a bit as well as far as you know key management, where it is who manages it. Uh, there's a lot of evolution to be done here. Custody services are being built by the major financial institutions. So it's not just cryptocurrency companies that are moving into the space. Uh, on the, I'll just give a personal comment and opinion about the social recovery as you were talking about it. And I, I know this isn't about enterprise blockchain here, but this is more about consumer stuff. Um, so one, I'm not sure I know seven people that I want to trust to necessarily like, you know, manage my assets. I mean, it might not matter if you have a million dollars, but it might matter if you have a lot more than that. Um, or maybe it matters to you if you have a million dollars or even a hundred thousand, it depends on your economic situation. Um, but you know- We work hard for our money, Dave. We work hard for our money. <laughs> we work hard for our money. <laughs> And, uh, but you know, it's it, okay. Well, maybe my dad sides with my ex-wife in a divorce situation. And then, you know, there's, there social things have a lot of, a, a lot of issues with them as well. And, you know, I, I'm not, I, I like the idea, but honestly, I sort of like the other idea, which is, okay, well, I'll tell my dad three or four of my recovery words and I'll put a number that says, you know, your number three in the chain. And he has no idea what it is. And I'm just like, store that safely, man. And then, you know, give my wife the coordinates of it and maybe give my lawyer and my trust fund manager it, but that's about it. And so there's ways to do it that I think technology is not just the solution. It needs to be thought about on a personal level on all these case edge cases. Um, for example, if you have, let's say, $100 million in crypto, how do you know that your four out of seven aren't just going to be colluding to go, well, um, it's $100 million bucks. I'll split it with you, 25, 25, 25. Um, I mean, you know, all of these things are things. 
yeah, to think I, about. I agree, I agree with you, Dave. I think the collusion is definitely really, a- really. Wow, I yeah. never thought of that. Yeah, exactly. Grandma, you got to watch out for her because collusion can happen. <laughs> you know, but it's Grandma. not part of it. Like nothing's Grandpa? perfect. Yeah, <laughs> but when it comes to money, people act a bit odd, but. Uh, you know, that's why if you read, you know, Vitalik's article, he talks about, you know, ideally you, you identify seven individuals that don't know each other as far as what, what they're, like Dave said, just give, give someone uh, the, the key phrase and, or the word and, and the number and, and get back to them. But, but I do think there's, there are technology solutions. It's, I think, Dave, I think there's a, there's a happy middle ground and innovation because the part of this as well is that that kind of approval process in a social recovery context uh, d- again, goes against what I, would, I would previously says. It slows business down from 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 executing. So, well, you know. I mean, I think that this. I was just reacting to it on a personal level, like a family planning level, an individual yeah. level, not on an enterprise level. Obviously, an enterprise level, there's a lot of things that can be done there. But yeah. I was just reacting on a on yeah, it's, a it's, purely it's, social yeah. level. I mean, Alex, I think all of this speaks really just to how difficult uh, this problem and actually is. Um, so for myself personally, um, I've thought about other things. One, I'm young enough that I haven't thought through this. If I died or something happened, all of my holdings are gone. Um, if I lost my memory, all of my holdings are gone. Um, and I am terrified of doing something like, you know, relying on a social model for precisely the reasons, uh, Dave, that you highlighted. But it also means that all of my holdings are gone if I, if I die, which at the moment I've consoled myself saying, well, that's the point of Bitcoin. It will just become more scarce. You shouldn't actually, I'm um, philosophically then at the moment with don't pass down your holdings. Um, <laughs> you know, it is, it, it, this actually may be the better way. Effectively, you are just donating to the entire network um, by going down. Um, but I do have this fear that, uh, you know, someday I fall down and hit my head and um, suddenly everything is gone, which I'll say also, I'm not sure, maybe there's a strong ski connection through all of this. Um, I grew up ski racing, uh, wearing my spider shirt right now. Um, as it's suddenly it dipped uh, close to zero in Montreal. Um, and so I suppose the other point is, you know, maybe one day I'm skiing a giant slalom, hit my head the wrong way, um, and suddenly all the Bitcoin's gone. So, yep. so it's something that I, I actively worry about. Um, and I have no succession plan either for myself on death or for myself on um, losing my memory. Yeah, well, what happens when you get older, Alex, you, you just lose your memory naturally. So that's what you have to look forward to. But, um, but you're right. I mean, crypto inheritance strategies, uh, you know, family office strategies and, and what you talked about, because I think a lot of, uh, you know, the three of us, there are companies who focus on the enterprise primarily, right? Um, and so there's strategies and you're know, dealing with family offices and they, they all have the right, uh, you know, the contracts in place that says, all right, if something happens, this is the password that that's going to be split up. The lawyer's going to hold on to this. Um, but how do you do crypto inheritance with uh, individual sub people like like Alex, right? And so I think that is is another area where you know innovation uh, and technology it's happening. I think that there's you have it's a happy medium, right? You have to have good technology that you can rely on, right? But also you have to trust people, right? And so. Uh, you know, if you're married, for example, my wife knows that we have a bunch of Bitcoin and uh, I just got married and uh, she, she, she asked us like, well, what happens? Like, like Alex says, if it happens to you, what's the plan? So aside from giving her this complicated string of words to remember, it's, it's complicated. So you have to have a crypto inheritance strategy, but also that comes down to this core issue, which is how, how do I manage something that's complex as, as a key phrase? How do I, you know, if you look up uh, Winklevoss, uh, the Winklevoss twins, and how they uh, um, how they protect their their funds, and there you just put Winklevoss uh, key management, and it's a very interesting uh, Wikipedia that they talk about how they store like phrases and words and banks all over the world, and uh, it's a big problem. But for sure, crypto inheritance is important. Yes, definitely. Pamela, Pamela Morgan actually has something on that crypto inheritance planning. If you Google Pamela Morgan and crypto inheritance, it'll come up. You know, it's a it's a book and just things that you can do um, to make things you know better for people when you when you pass on. Alex. <laughs> Alex yeah, so. no, I, the other point I was going to make too is that I think we're going to see different solutions based on you know what's straightforward for people to implement. Because I'll tell you, my inheritance plan is quite straightforward. It is possible to, you know, script this to make it so that, you know, some UTXOs get spent out to another set of addresses, you know, some years down the line. You know, I believe in the long term what, what Bitcoin is going to do. The way I would do inheritance planning is to simply say, you know, you go do your private keys the way you do them. I'll do them my way. 
Um, and every, you know, perhaps 10 years, if I don't broadcast the right message, you'll get them. Um, but the problem is that, that that solution is great, but there's no way you're going to recommend that to the average person and have them agree that, yeah, that there, there's the solution, let's do that. Um, there has to be um, something that is, and this is where I think things like social recovery are interesting is that um, it's something that the average person will be in tune with. They'll understand the notion of, I trust some, some subset of people that I trust not to con conspire and collude against me. Um, and that's how I want to you know, conduct my affairs. Okay, so I want to get to this. This has been really great. Um, Vinit asked a question and it's uh, here in the chat. Is there a way to quantify the loss associated with a potential breach as a way to justify the spend slash investment on preventative measures, security, et cetera? How have you justified the cost in the past? Does anybody want to take that? I'll start, and um, in if you're talking about blockchain that is tied to virtual assets where there's value, so cryptocurrencies or NFTs, um, non-fungible tokens, then you know there's some value to it. So that's actually a pretty darn trivial conversation these days, which is, um, you know, a potential breach is loss of everything. So if I'm holding 60 million or I'm Quadriga and I'm holding 200 million or I'm, you know, I don't know, Binance holding 50 billion or what have you, you know, it's pretty darn easy to establish what, even if you're, even if you only hold 10 million as a business, your tiny little trading firm, it's pretty darn easy to understand that. Um, but I'd leave it over to the other gentleman here on the call to, to think about, you know, if you're not a, if it's if it's just pure blockchain um, that doesn't have a you know it's being used for I don't know uh, tracking cargo containers uh, that would be a more nuanced conversation. Anyone want to add to that? Yeah, it's, I mean I think it's I don't think it's hard to justify the whole fear factor selling around. Hey, um, we're protecting money. It's not like you're protecting some Salesforce. Uh, uh, data, uh, customer information, or like Facebook continues to fail, fail to do protecting the, uh, their consumer data. This is money. All right, money is a completely different animal as far as a digital asset. And and the, I think the best uh, you know justification is that start off with the basics. Is that like Dave said, what happens if you know you know if you lose money? So in the crypto space and, and security, it's easily why I love about the space and why I, I switched over out of the traditional. Um, um, tech, tech space and into crypto is that we have great technology and uh, um, and the innovation here is phenomenal. So I think it's um, I think there's no it's not hard to convince customers and even crypto startups are, that hey you know what this is the investment you need to make and they all understand that I'm investing in these controls because it's going to protect my business and ultimately my shareholders and etc. So. I think this may be a good time for me to chime in with uh, any insurance points, which is this is the basics of insurance, which is how much is it worth to you? You know, um, you want to make X claim in the future. Um, I will present to you the option to pay Y premium per month um, leading up to that. If you believe that that is a fair deal, you should take it. If not, um, you don't. Um, and then the price signals basically work themselves out. This is why we strongly believe that bearer instruments like Bitcoin held in centralized custodial systems need to be fully insured. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, it is the case that the insurance industry at large cannot provide the capacity that we need. Um, but that is kind of Knox's singular focus in the medium term is uh, make it so that this currently quarter trillion dollars in the future, much larger sum of cryptocurrency can actually be um, insured. And so ultimately, you can say there is no foolproof system um, in the same way that there's no unsinkable ship. And I simply want to operate systems such that I can make the claim event in the future. And a neat thing about that also is that it actually incentivizes the right security practices to come in. You start saying, well, I will expend some amount of you know, resources in order to improve my systems, uh, but I'll actually get it back in insurance premiums. So in the same way you might pay more for a car and you get much less, um, you know, pay much less in insurance, um, you might pay more for a software system um, because it actually ends up being cheaper in a total cost of ownership standpoint. Yeah. Makes sense. So we have um, one last question and we'll get into a question from Denise. So looking towards the future, it's clear that popularity of cryptocurrencies is gonna to continue to grow. I'm happy about that. 
Um, how do you believe the overall industry needs to evolve to become more secure? What do you guys think? Well, I, um, I, I make an analogy to the credit card industry. So uh, obviously education is one, training is another, specialization is another, and I think the other panelists have some ideas on that. But in the credit card industry, they came up with a, if you will, a standard called PCI, which is to protect customer information. And you can't be a credit card processor if you don't comply. And that has things about where you store customer information, how you encrypt it, who gets access to it, audit requirements around it. Um, I think in our industry, in the blockchain and virtual asset industry, we're not that evolved yet. There are efforts, Cloud Security Alliance, there's a number of others, uh, Blockchain Alliance who are putting things out, some of the government agencies are putting things out. This is where we need to evolve, I think, to be able to start having companies comply with well-known, well-written and auditable policies so that you can have a Deloitte or a KPMG or Pricewaterhouse come in and audit and give you a security audit similar to uh, you know how you audit data centers today. Yeah. yeah, actually, Dave, you just touched on something um, that we're, we're, we're going to um, talk about quickly, compliance, but Ricardo, you had a question, or you have something you wanted to add? No, no, I agree. I, just, uh, mm -hmm. I think it's it's not often you hear um, uh, technology leaders uh, talk about, hey, we need more regulations. <laughs> and so, you know, because regs, regs slow things down, slows down innovations, et cetera. But, when you're dealing with money um, and you're dealing with this wild west that we're living in today when it comes to crypto, uh, Dave's a thousand percent correct. You need these kind of, uh, you know, typically a piece of legis legislation doesn't get created until uh, some bad things happen and the government has to get involved. But if you do follow some of the best practices like PCI, that Dave's talking about the payment card industry standard, um, and you start, and if the governments do want to uh, enforce or, or some type of legislation, that's a great starting point. It's like, if you're going to be managing cryptocurrencies, you know, what are those? Uh, and, and there are some certain things I think like having your SOC 2, SOC 2 is a type of certifications for, for businesses. If you're going to store, if you're going to be a custodian, for example, that you have to like, Alex has his own set of uh, certificate um, legislations and things to be, to stay legal from a compliance perspective. But for sure, I agree 150% with, uh, with Dave that, better legislation matters and, and we need to see it. Um, Dave is, is famous because one of the things I love about him is that he works with, uh, he works with the regulators, right? He's helping them understand, you know, from Wyoming to the federal government when they're, when they're because they're clueless, right? They don't have no idea. Right? And so it's, hey, we wanna stop everything. And you have someone that like David comes in, it's like, well, this is probably the best type of controls. So we continue to be innovative and continue to move forward. So it definitely requires some collaboration with regulators. But for sure, I agree that we need uh, better legislation to, to put some controls in place that can protect the consumer. Which is actually pretty um, leading to my next question. Um, from a compliance standpoint, what do you think that the industry needs to be A, wary about and B, embrace and, and ask more about, more of? Uh, certainly, I can inject my, my favorite subject, which is insurance, and perhaps even answer the last question with some more of that, um, which is, you know, we certainly follow a lot of different standards. You know, we have our SOC 2 type 2. Um, ultimately, the point of these things is for an outsider to be able to look at a system and be able to assert that it is functioning well. Um, and the ultimate point here is that it would allow somebody to actually look at a system and be able to price a risk. Um, and for, for me, you know, as soon as you can do that and you can let price signals fly, um, then you don't much need any kind of kind of top-down specific, these are the protocols, these are the things that you need to do. Um, it comes down to if you can get the insurance um, and you know you can meet the originated risk with ultimately the capital markets that will supply the claim event, um, then you've gone a long way towards assuring um, the community of safety. Um, certainly for us, for example, getting our insurance policy was a whole lot more difficult than the SOC 2 type 2, but you know the SOC 2 type 2 ends up being quite critical. A lot of auditors of our customers and others look at it and scrutinize us more on that than, than the insurance itself, um, even though the former was, I think, more difficult to attain um, and is a better you know, signal of, of the underlying safety of the systems. Um, and then I suppose from a compliance perspective, although I wouldn't want everybody to say everyone must be one-to-one -one insured um, until we can 
solve this capacity problem. Um, I do believe in the, in the future, these kinds of demands will be made. Um, for most of human history, you know, bearer instruments are just not held in an uninsured fashion. Nobody's buying a Picasso painting worth $50 million and saying, well, I can't get the insurance, so it's just gonna send my house and let it burn. Um, the insurance will come. <laughs> No, and even totally agree with you. even even in the decentralized finance space, where where there's no you know, it, it's a different world, right? They have insurance, right? I think the, Alex makes great points. I think there's a company called uh, Nexus Mutual, for example. So if you've invested in some high risk uh, DeFi protocol, Nexus Mutual will insure you uh, if something should happen, like uh, the liquidity uh, gets uh, gets drained of that particular liquidity pool that you're in. So um, for sure, insurance is key. And in this industry, you, you're gonna see, need more of it. Uh, I love the fact that this is a custodian that has insurance as well uh, with Alex's company. Um, one question I had that I saw in the chat there is around NFTs, Alex. Yes. So are you seeing, um, I haven't seen, I haven't checked in Lexus, Nexus Mutual or the other, uh, the crypto insurance companies, but do you guys insure as well as NFTs as well as uh, cryptocurrencies, traditional cryptocurrencies? So no, not our present, but I've had people approach us saying effectively, you know, Sotheby's and others are holding <laughs> on like MetaMask wallets. Some have seen some money um, and they probably need this kind of thing. Um, I had historically used fine art actually as a good analogy, which is there's this hard asset, you know, again, nobody's buying up a cost of painting worth $50 million and holding it uninsured. Um, and yet we're doing it here with, um, you know, some digitally scarce uh, piece of information. So I'm sure it's something that's going to come up. Certainly for, for us in Knox, we really like to think of Knox in terms of a distributed key management system um, and really saying what we what we ensure is really the, the divulgence of secrets, uh, which happen to be used for you know ECDSA key signing. Um, but these, these things can generalize to most anything. Um, anytime people put value on you know some pe some piece of um, digital scarce data, um, you know, we really believe it should be insurable. Yeah, wow. They just have their money sitting in the MetaMask. That, that, that fund, that kills me. That kills me, um, what you just said, Alex. But uh, Vinny, we hope that answers your question. And, you know, gentlemen, I think we are coming up onto the hour, and this has been absolutely great. I really enjoy this. I enjoy this a little bit too much. I'm not going to kid you. Is there anything that you guys can think of that, you know, you want to close out that you want people to know? So I'm going to just add a little bit on the uh, just to Emma to the last question and, and wrap it up for my side of things is there's a lot of regulations going on in Canada that are um, reflective of what the financial action task force is doing. So that's a global uh, regulatory body. It's headquartered in Paris, but it, it has about 190 countries as members. So I would encourage um, everybody to take a look at what the FATF virtual asset contact group is doing. There was a period of commentary that ended um, this week, but uh, there will be new recommendations in June, but it definitely worth looking at because it does start to include DeFi providers um, into the definition of what they call a virtual asset service provider. So an exchange or a trading company. So I think we, you know, everyone should take a look at what's happening there because that is going to affect global regulations for all blockchain products. Okay, Thank that's you. important to know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Ricardo, perhaps, yeah, certainly. Oh, sorry, Alex, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, I'll, I'll, I'll plug what you perhaps started with, uh, Emma, which is how to, happy to say today, uh, we announced a partnership with Olympia Trust Company in order to produce Canada's first qualified custodian. Um, and perhaps boat, boat back to the Alberta ski point. Shamefully, I've never been to Alberta. Um, I'll have to go go out there and, 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 and visit Olympia and others. Um, Never been to all the certainly all the best ski uh, resorts in Canada are known to be in Alberta. Um, and as a ski racer, um, I'll have to uh, write that wrong. So there you go. Well, B BC too, right? You've been to BC. BC's though. good, yeah. Sure. BC's good. Number two, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Revy and stuff, but yeah, hit Alberta. Alberta's awesome. Yeah. yeah I'm a big fan of Lake Louise, the whole, uh, whole area. And Ricardo, anything else you wanted to add as we wrap up? No, I think it's been a great panel. I think it's just a, when, as an enterprise, I think when you're getting into space, you know, it's always the same type of security risks. Um, the the digital asset infrastructures that we're designing every day for companies uh, uh, are, are really interesting, you know, and the innovation is fantastic. Um, and if you're a startup in this space and, you, and you're, and I think if you've, if you've listened to this, I think the biggest takeaway is that, you know, you should 
have some kind of plan, you know, and don't bolt on the security later. Um, if you're looking to deal with cryptocurrency, you have a great application, fantastic. But um, what is what's the next, you know, five to ten, five year plan when it comes to your business, right? And then what are those controls that you can put in place that, that you know, you have your traditional controls, the security controls and privacy controls that we've talked about, but also what is what's some of the technology and what can you do to also improve your best practices around secure coding. All these things you talked about are so key that we talk about them, but we don't see enough uh, execution. And I'd love to see more of these startups and, and product leaders to say, hey, let's not forget <laughs> that we need to add some security to this so we can continue to move money forward like uh, we do at BRD. Yeah, excellent. Well, that's a really great note to end on. So I wanna thank you, David. I wanna thank you, Ricardo. I wanna thank you, Alex, for joining us. It was a really great interactive session. I really enjoyed it. And we're going to have this available later for anyone who wants to watch it um, online. So thank you so much for joining us, gentlemen. And I hope you guys have a great day. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, yeah, thank you. Cheers. And thanks, Koya.